好，我我会用中英文来夹杂，这样的话哈，就大家可能都可以听得到，我们的导师也知道我在干什么。啊、呃，首先呢，大家好，我是 Ivy Compass 的 CEO Sophia， 呃，很高兴为大家主持和提供今天晚上的金牌导师的升学知识分享。我呢，第一呢，想这借这个机会呢，感谢 c a t h y 老师和 CFF 平台几位义工，包括 a l a n Gracie， 他们前期都做了大量的协调工作，感谢您的辛这个辛辛勤付出，给我们这样一个赞助机会和分享优质资源的机会。同时呢，我也非常感谢大家。在百忙之中抽出时间来跟我们一起学习。像刚刚我在另外一个学习小组里面也分享了，呃，其实这样的分享哈，呃，我们要 open mind， 呃，不要仅仅认为是我家里只有 high school 的 student， 或者是我要去奔那个藤校的学生，您才来学习。其实您如果通过这些导师们，今天晚上的这个导师是非常受欢迎的。如果通过他们的分享，您换过来就是以终为始去思考。因为我们的小孩子到了高中，不是一下子就到了高中的。他前面在初中和小学和这个小小的时候，我们怎么培养他，能够 prepare them to come to a high school level? So everything counts. If you could spending the time to understanding what is the U.S. top university is looking for, and in in return to understanding how we prepare your child in the elementary school stage and middle school stage. And then that way, when they in high school stage, they will be already prepared to taking on more more challenging responsibility to apply U.S. university. So our coach is actually erase your anxiety. It's not adding more stress. I often have a a parents coming to me saying, "My child already very busy. I don't want to hire anybody because they're going to give me more work to do, and then they're going to adding more stress. They're going to make my child doing a lot more work." That's not the the purpose. The purpose is have somebody knowing the system so well, knowing what to do to make your time spend more efficiently, to make sure that everything you do in the limited time during the high school four years, so you will be better prepared for your college life, and also knowing what to do to make sure your potential is fully、uh, expressed. So tonight, the two speaker, I'm very honored to present you. And because they are so well liked by our past family, and John,、um, his experience is so rich, and his coaching is so efficient.、Um, he working very very hard.、Uh, unlike some of the family signing to some small shop、uh, coach, and they sign you up, they disappear. We will not do that. Okay, we will not do that to to rest in shore.、Uh, John is a former director of admission for College Arts and Science at Cornell for many many years, and he also was former senior associate director admission for Lehigh University. And Quentin is Ivy Campus counselor. He also is trained Cornell reader, and he was working with John for a while now. And he is very in line with John's leadership and coaching style. So he, as a team with John, will be providing、um, cohesive, holistic. Support to your child's application, the 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 time being in the high school. Okay, give me a little bit time to introduce you. Who is Ivy Campus? Ivy Campus Chinese name is Zhenan Zheng Xiao Yu Zixun. Ah, we are is dedicated to making the best Chinese teachers in the world. Independent teacher, artist, music, music teacher, teacher, conferences, events, etc. The lost resources are given to our global Chinese family. 当然 ，Ivy Campus 还提供定制化的志愿者机会、社会影响力、科研以及实习等背景提升项目，在全方位的把控您升学服务质量的同时呢，我们还特别的着重培养提升学生的软实力、领导力和为孩子的全面个人成长保驾护航。像我们这个，我的孩子已经啊、呃，这个大学研究生啊、呃，都这个呃毕业哈，所以。我觉得升学这个事情，如果做得好的话呢，您的团队选的正确的话呢，它实际上是让孩子在高中期间一个蜕变的过程。所以我很期待能够有机会跟家长们一起探讨，如何一边升着学，把这个短期目标达到，同时还能够在过程当中让小孩子明白如何去很好的跟这个社会上的一些机会去对接，寻求到对的资源，然后让自己能够更加的蜕变哈，对更加的这个腾飞。那我们的服务从三个方面，第一呢是 focus on candidacy 的 building， 我们提供 non-profit volunteerism opportunity， 
，我们也提供 soft skill 和 leadership 的 building。啊、呃，同时呢，还提供 research program、competition co a c h i n g 和 training、summer program 和 school 的这个寻找、ACT、AP、IB 的 tutoring。从 admission support 方面呢，我们也做 undergrad application、undergraduate transfer、grad school 的 application、elite high school 的这个 application。同时，对 art、design、college application 和 music school 的 application， 我们都有相当好的团队来配合您，帮助孩子做这个方面的 portfolio。啊，其次呢，我们还有 admission assessment evaluation， 呃，提供 formal admission officer， 同时也提供 essay 的 review。对 art、design and music portfolio 的 building 和 review 呢，都有相当多的资源去提供给你孩子全方位的帮助。为什么选择我们呢？因为我们的导师 80% 的 applicant 都能够被 top 50的 university 所接受。同时呢。我们团队包括我跟 Alison 在内，我们前期做大量的功课，去 best fit 您的学生、您的孩子是不是跟 counselor fit。我们的 philosophy 是没有最好的导师，只有合适的导师，因为每个导师多少还是有一点 personality 的 style 的 difference。所以我们要 make sure 我们的孩子是能够认同导师的指导，因为当一旦这个 relationship coaching exists 的话。这个 trusting 非常非常重要，你要跟着导师的这个节奏，因为他知道如何帮助你规划你最好的这个 portfolio， 就跟那个找工作是一个一个道理啊。啊、呃，这边呢快速的我不花时间了，您看到我们2021年和22年这个合作导师的这个录取记录呢是什么学校都有的。我经常接到家长的问询说，啊，你们的导师是可尿的，他会不会帮我们申请哈佛呀 ？Yes， they can。They can understand all different school top school because their philosophy is the same because they all use holistic review. Ah,、uh, so next, ah, I will give you the floor to give you the brilliant presentation. Today evening, ah, again for John and Quentin, thank you very much for your time to come and share with us your knowledge. Now, John, you can turn on your camera. Quentin, you can turn on your camera and video. And now I'm give the floor to you. Ah,、uh, I know both of you have a pool of knowledge to share. So let me. Have you start? Thank you so much for your time. Alrighty, good evening, ladies and gentlemen.、Um, thank you for the introduction. Once again, I'm John Morganelli, a former Ivy League admissions director from Cornell University, founder of Ivy League Admissions LLC, and author of Growing Ivy: How to Crack the Code on Elite College Admissions. I'm joined by my colleague Quentin, and today we want to share a presentation titled "Application Resume vs. Application Story: The Difference." Between offer and waiting list. Before we jump into college admissions, for those of you who have not attended other presentations of mine, I just want to briefly、uh, introduce my background. I have been a senior level admissions officer at three different、uh, U.S. institutions. I've personally reviewed over thirty thousand applications for admission over a decade in college admissions.、Um, I was part of the review panel at the University of Pennsylvania when they rolled out their Brand new committee-based evaluation review process.、Uh, I was at Lehigh University at that time, and I was asked to review their process, and so I know it intimately. I was fortunate that when I was at Cornell,、uh, for those of you who don't know, every two years there's an enrollment summit amongst the Ivy Plus schools. The Ivy Plus schools are all the Ivy League schools plus MIT, Duke, and Stanford. Every two years, the deans and directors from those schools get together for an enrollment summit. We hosted it in Ithaca, New York, when I was the director of admissions,、um, and it was a great opportunity to learn about all of the policies and procedures of all the Ivy League schools, plus MIT, MIT, Duke, and Stanford. Much of the policies and procedures and the way they're building their communities are similar. And then finally, I was appointed as an Ivy League admissions director, managing every part of the process for over twenty thousand applications. I supervised a staff of eighty percent PhD faculty members, and I hired and trained over forty application readers. Per year. Okay.、Um, after presentations, I try to collect feedback, and one of the things that I've、uh, been told by some of the people listening into the presentations is that they had trouble following along because they did not have a familiarity with the terms. So I wanted to take a moment here to go over some of the definitions that we'll be discussing tonight. If through the presentation today. You become aware of other terms that you're not familiar with. Please jot them down. Quentin and I will answer some questions after the presentation, and we can 
answer some of those definition questions for you. The first question, the first definition that is, <clears throat> is academic direction. I use that term a lot, so I just wanna make sure that everybody is on the same page. When I'm referring to a student's academic direction, I'm referring broadly to the area that they're interested in in high school. So maybe they're interested in the humanities, maybe they're interested in the social sciences, maybe they're interested in STEM areas, that's kind of their broad academic direction. The next term that you will hear me use is majors. There are two different types of majors that we will be referring to. There's a prospective major and there's an actual major. Your prospective major is what we'll be talking a lot about today. That's what you put down on your application for admission. That's what the admissions reader is uh, making their decision based on, based on the area of academia you say you're going into. It's prospective because it's not your actual major until your second semester of your sophomore year of college at most institutions. And that's when you actually declare your major. So prospective major and actual major are not the same thing. They might be the same designation, but they might not be the same designation. So it's important to know the difference between prospective major and actual major. Uh, the third definition is holistic review. I know that Sophia went over this a little bit in the beginning of the presentation. Holistic review is the fundamental difference between the review process in the United States and the review process most everywhere else in the world. Holistic review does not mean that the colleges and universities are looking for well-rounded students. A lot of people think holistic review means well-rounded. That's not what it means. We'll talk about that later. Holistic review means that they are going to consider more than the quantitative data points when making a decision. They're going to take into consideration qualitative factors. So holistic review means we're going to take into consideration the whole student, not just intellectual quantitative data points. The fourth definition is your personal statement or your college essay. Uh, this is probably the essay that you heard the most about. It is the Common App essay. It is sent to every single school you apply to. It's important because it gets sent to every single school you apply to, but oftentimes it's not the most important essay. The most important essay usually is number five on this definition list, the supplemental essay. That essay is the institutional specific essay. Duke has their own, Columbia has their own, Cornell has their own, Harvard has their own. Those essays, those prompts were developed by the admissions office, by the deans and directors. They're trying to elicit specific information so that they can better build their community. So between the two, generally the two different types of essays, personal statement slash college essay, supplemental essay, those are the two different types that are often part of this process. The supplemental essay often is in fact the more impactful essay. Number six is the app is application story or narrative. That's a phrase that I use, a term that I use to describe the story that we want to share with the admissions office. You know, many of you, especially the adults out there, you have resumes, you've applied for jobs. A resume is not a story, right? A resume is a list of things you've done. A story is a strategic intentional list of things that is supposed to elicit a specific response from the reader. We build application stories, not application resumes. Most students will apply with an application resume, a list of things they've done without the intellectual leaps between the things. Why did they do what they did? So we're focused on application story or application narrative. We don't want a resume. Number seven is overrepresented academic major. And number eight is underrepresented academic major. These two terms go together. Kind of self-explanatory. Overrepresented academic majors are areas that are highly popular, right? Computer science, biology, pre-med. These are areas that lots of students are interested in, and thus they become overrepresented in the applicant pool. Underrepresented majors are areas that are less popular. Greek literature, the classics, the humanities generally are less popular and thus become underrepresented because there are less applications in the applicant pool that are under this academic area. Okay, if, none of, if any of that didn't make sense, please feel free to jot it down and we'll try to answer questions at the end. Okay, Quentin, you're up next. Okay, so this data was taken directly from a Harvard lawsuit. I just wanted to take a moment to examine it in a bit more depth. 
Um, what does it mean? And what do you what does it mean when you really break it down? So if we only use grades and test scores, including AP scores, Asian students represent 43% of the incoming class at Harvard, represented by model one under the academic only column. When we throw in extracurricular and personal aspects like the percentage of class, or the percentage of the class drops down to 26%, which was represented by model three under the extracurricular and personal column. That means that 17% 17% of the spaces at Harvard are lost because the applicant failed to demonstrate desirable personal qualities through thoughtfully conceived extracurricular activities. This has nothing to do with the fact that the applicant is actually Asian. As we notice, I'm not even mentioning column four, which takes demographics of being Asian into account. I'm focused on the 17%, which is the difference between the 43% noted in the model of column one and the 26% noted in the third column. This is the 17% that represents the students who should have been admitted had they demonstrated a desirable personal qualities through thoughtfully conceived extracurricular activities. The point here is that extracurricular activities engagements matter a lot. And I can confirm that I witnessed this with the last pool of students that I work with. The ones with more targeted extracurricular activities that contributed to their narratives were the ones that were admitted in ED1. Asian students often build their applications like resumes and include engagement experiences and qualities that are not really valued at top tier universities. Your job is to choose the right qualities, the right engagements, and the right tone for the overall academic story. So we're going to next explore how exactly we do that. So before we jump into learning more about how to build an application that reads like an academic story rather than a resume, it's important to start with the understanding of what type of story we're trying to tell. In order to determine that, we need to look at the questions being asked amongst the top 50 US universities. The slide provides a few examples, but if you were to dive deeper, you'd find that over 80% of the top tier colleges are asking the same thing. What do you want to study? Why do you want to study it? How have you explored it? And what might you contribute to this space at this particular college or university? These questions illustrate that our story is clearly an academic story. Remember that the application isn't a resume, it's a story. And if all they wanted was a list of achievements, the application would be quite simple. But the holistic review process is quantitative and qualitative analysis. It requires a story, not just a list of experiences. Most students, even the smart ones, will provide a rather disjointed list of experiences and achievements that fail to effectively communicate areas of interest, engagement, and potential contribution. Effective ac academic stories are built through illustrating how a variety of different engagements support that identified area of academic interest. These engagement experiences and the connections between them will serve as the evidence that the student is interested in and are ready to contribute. Okay, before we can build your academic story, we need to know the academic area you plan to identify. The first step in identifying which type of college the student is seeking is in the beginning, understanding the options. Okay, generally at the undergraduate level, when you're applying to a university, there are three undergraduate colleges that most students will consider. You can see them on the screen, business, engineering, and arts and sciences. In the green box at the bottom, you can see there are specialty colleges, right? At Cornell is a great example where there are multiple specialty colleges, like the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences or the College of Human Ecology. Most students will fall under the first three. So at the beginning of almost every conversation, the first thing that we want to do is orient the student to the different types of colleges, because that's the first question the readers are going to ask. What type of college is this student applying to? A business school, an engineering school, or an arts and sciences school? If you hope to apply as a prospective engineering or prospective business student, it is advised you make that decision very early. Since both colleges are pretty specific, many of the applicants will have specific interests that translate to deep academic stories of investigation in those spaces. Since most students that I work with fall into the groups of arts and sciences, and the reason for that is if they start early, it's hard to decide on business because Harvard doesn't even have an undergraduate business program. So most students, when they start to build their story, will build around arts and sciences. And then if they decide business or engineering, they'll try to make that transition a little later. So we start with a foundation, usually, of arts and sciences. So since most students fall there, we'll start, we'll focus most of our conversation today around the College of Arts and Sciences. The College of Arts and Sciences is the most flexible type of college. It has everything from economics and computer science 
to biology, Greek literature, and the classics. Before we discuss how to consider the right perspective major, right? Not the right actual major, that's different, we'll talk about that later, but the right perspective major, it's important to note the distinction between a college and a university. At a university, there are multiple colleges, right? So at Cornell, for example, there are seven different colleges. I tell you this because as we move forward, it will be important for you to understand the strategy behind what it is that I'm saying. So let's start with understanding the process of the strategy. When you choose a college, one college over the other, say you choose an engineering college or a business college, there is a consequence to that. The business school might be more selective. The engineering school might be less selective. The arts and sciences school might be less selective all at the same university. So it's important to recognize every choice you make, what type of college, what type of prospective major has a consequence in the level of competitiveness of getting into that school. Okay, there are two points that I'm trying to make here. Number one, identifying the correct undergraduate college is very important. And the reason for that is that transferring amongst the colleges, even at the same university, is not guaranteed. If you start in the engineering college and you want to move to the business college, you might not be able to do it. If you start in the arts and sciences college and want to move to the business college, you might not be able to do it. So transferring colleges, we call that an internal transfer, is not guaranteed and in some instances difficult to do. So it's important that we at least know that the things that you're interested in doing, you might not know exactly what you want to do, but we want to know the general things you're interested in doing so that we can choose the right type of college because transferring college is not guaranteed. Once we choose the right type of college, we're in the engineering college, we're in the business college, we're in the arts and sciences college, and that's the right type because it has access to what the student actually wants. Then we are in a good position because we have access to all of the majors in that college. Changing majors in the same college is quite easy. You can move from art to physics. You can move from economics to history, as long as that's in the same college. Transferring college is harder. So I, I know I repeat that often, but it's really an important part of the strategy of what we talk about. So if you're not sure, if it doesn't make sense, please jot that down and we can answer some questions about that later. Thus, when we are considering prospective majors, we're considering two things. Number one, we want to make sure we have identified the appropriate college so the student has access to what they want to do. And two, Assuming we have identified the appropriate college, we want to consider the, the competitiveness of the prospective majors the student is considering. So let's just say for argument's sake, we were considering the College of Arts and Sciences. Okay, now all of the majors in the College of Arts and Sciences are possible as prospective majors. Maybe the student is interested in STEM areas. So they're interested in computer science and pre-med. Those are very highly competitive areas. So we have to ask ourselves, is that the best way under the STEM area in the College of Arts and Sciences, is that the best way for the student to apply to college? So we are considering the college and the prospective major underneath that college when we're beginning to build our strategy. If this part is not clear, jot down a question. I'm happy to go over it again. It is fundamentally important to our process and to our strategy. Okay, I want to provide a quick reminder, right? We've been talking about this a lot of the difference between the prospective major and the actual major before we continue on. Remember, the prospective major is the thing that you, the major you write down on your application for admission. It is important because the reader is saying to themselves, is this a competitive area? How many more competitive students do I have? And that is part of the lens that they are using to read your application. Prospective major matters, but it is not your actual major, right? That is the final major that you will declare when you actually get to college. They are different, and it's important to recognize that difference. Once a student has identified the type of college, arts and sciences, business or engineering, the next objective is, in fact, to identify the prospective major. Why do we need a prospective major? A lot of students and parents will ask me, why do I need a prospective major when I could apply as an undecided student? Maybe I don't know what I want to study. Why do I need to identify this prospective major? The answer to that question is that there are two different types of undecided students. If you're the right type of undecided student, the type that is truly undecided because you've 
investigated lots of areas. I investigated biology. I investigated computer science. I investigated history or public policy. And I have engagement experiences in all of that area, all of those areas. I just haven't figured out which one's my favorite. I haven't figured out how to put them all together. That type of undecided student can work. Very well engaged, lots of investigation, and they haven't figured out exactly what they're going to do. That's okay. But most undecided students are not that. It's that they have not involved themselves very much. They have not investigated the areas of academia, and they're undecided because they just don't know what these areas are actually all about. That does not work. The colleges and universities want to understand what it is you want to study. And if you don't know, they want to know all of the different options that you're considering, and they want to understand that you've investigated those options. So it is very important to recognize that students that don't investigate or they investigate at a surface level, those students are waitlisted. Students that create great depth investigation, those students are the ones that are often admitted. I believe the best strategy in the beginning, especially for young students, is to identify one academic area of interest and create depth. If you have time later on, it's great to add other areas of academic interest on top, but it is imperative that there is substance and depth in one academic area first. Final reminder here as we talk about prospective majors and building depth and specificity. High school guidance counselors love to tell high school students that colleges want well-rounded students. And even if you went into a college right now and you asked them, do you want well-rounded students? An admissions officer might say, yes, we do want well-rounded students because they do want well-rounded human beings on their campus. But it is very important for you all to recognize that college admissions officers are not tasked with finding well-rounded students. They are tasked with enrolling a well-rounded class. Right? So if you bring in a great physicist, a great artist, a great historian, you bring them all together, you create a great well-rounded class. There's a difference between a great well-rounded class and a well-rounded student. Your job in this process is to be a puzzle piece of the well-rounded class, not to be well-rounded yourself. Okay, so let's assume for a moment that we have successfully identified an academic direction and we wanna begin building evidence. It starts with illustrating your interest by taking an initial action to explore. The most accessible exploratory experiences are the high school clubs and organizations that you can join. Even if you as a student aren't interested in the club offerings or don't think that they're interesting, there's still some expectation that you'll engage with the school community and help make those clubs better or to start a club that doesn't yet exist. From that foundation of in-school extracurricular engagements, the student can add to the foundation through things like summer programs, community shadowing, and out-of-school organizations. From there, we're going to try to create depth through more targeted engagements. We consider the best targeted engagements to either be academic research that ends with an abstract that can be used as the focal point in the application, or depending on the academic area, an issue-based community engagement that ends with an advocacy article that builds on or supports the rest of the application story. So this initial action and corresponding depth creation is what creates the academic story. And it will lead the reader to see the desirable qualities of curiosity, self-motivation, independence, creativity, problem solving, and persistence. But more importantly, it's the students learn how to investigate the world around them. They begin to understand how a fleeting question like, why does my school receive less funding than another nearby high school, can turn into a true investigatory experience that leads to deeper understanding and provides an opportunity for a young person to learn how to contribute and solve multidisciplinary problems. So this next slide, I wanna take a, a moment to provide a more visual illustration as to how the different elements fit into the story and how that story determines the student chances of earning an offer from a top tier university. Let's take a look at the green box to start. You can see that there are six different categories of engagement. The first one, in-school clubs and organizations. Number two, summer programs. Three, jobs, internships, shadowing four research, five competition, six local engagement. These are ways to explore the world. 
right? The first one being in school clubs. These are your most foundational opportunity. That's one way. If, if you take a look at the green box, you can see the student examples. This was for environmental public policy. So the question that is asked is if I'm interested in environmental public policy, what schools, I mean, what clubs and organizations in my school should I be in? One example, a very general example would be Science Olympiad. Would that make sense? Sure. If I was interested in something related to environmental public policy, Science Olympiad could make sense. After you engage and explore at a high school level, the readers, the college admissions readers, want to see how you take your interest and passion outside the classroom. Oftentimes, the best opportunity for that is during the summer, at least in the beginning. And foundational opportunities are summer programming. So maybe I'm interested in environmental public policy, and maybe I find an environmental public policy summer program that I can attend that illustrates during my free time outside of school, I'm still investigating on this topic. After that experience, the readers are going to see the next step. What is that next level of engagement? A summer program is great because it shows you're interested outside of school structured time, but a summer program is still a very structured experience. It's a programmatic experience, you know, created for you. Jobs and internships are a little less so, right? They're real, a little more real world experience. So now you can add a new dynamic to your investigation through something like uh, an internship at the Wildlife Sanctuary, right? Now you're getting a real world experience that's giving you a different lens on that same academic area of environmental public policy. The fourth one you see is research, right? After I've involved myself in a real world experience, hopefully I start to develop some questions about that area of academia. And if I can develop an interesting question, then maybe I will engage in research. Almost all of our students, whether they're in humanities, social science, or STEM areas, will engage in research. Of course, many STEM students will engage in research, but what you'll find is research in the social sciences or humanities can be even more impactful because less students do it. And a well-developed research question pulls in the things that you've already done and foreshadows what you say you're going to do in the future. So many of our activities are built around identifying a research question that can kind of serve as the foundation of our academic story. Number five you see is competition. You know, colleges and universities always value objective achievement. So, you know, if you can be um, in a STEM-oriented competition like Regeneron, or you could be in a debate competition, no matter what math competition, no matter what that is going to be valued. It is something that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about. I don't build my strategy around it because it's not controllable by a consultant, right? I can't guarantee a student's going to win a competition. And so I don't focus much of my time on it. We do have resources on our Ivy Compass team to help students through competition like the Wharton Investment Program. But as it relates to college consulting, for me specifically, I focus on story development because I know that although competition can be helpful, it is not necessary at, I would say, almost every single school in the country, with the exception possibly of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, and MIT. Those five schools, you could argue maybe you need some level of objective achievement. Every other school in the country, Cornell, Penn, Dartmouth, Brown, Hopkins, Duke, it'd be nice to have objective achievement, but you really can be successful without objective achievement, simply having depth of investigation in one or two academic areas. And then the sixth area on that green box you can see is local engagement. I put a star next to it because it's probably the category that is most often ignored. Students will write about, you know, uh, issues that they're exploring in Zimbabwe, right? That they're traveling around the world, building homes, solving problems, but they don't engage in the problems in their own community. And I'm not talking about fundraising, right? A lot of students think that's about fundraising. This isn't about raising money. This is about identifying a problem in your community and investigating that problem through an intellectual lens. If you can do that on a local level, your application will absolutely come to life. An example of that, uh, you see, uh, maybe you can see on the screen, it said solar farming. I had a student uh, this past year, the local issue, they were, it was also environmental public policy, the local issue that that student was exploring was, should we use this public land in my county for solar farming or traditional crop farming? And there was a big debate in his community as to whether or not 
the yield on the traditional farming was worth ignoring the potential opportunity of solar farming. The student engaged in real research, academic research, engaged in investigative journalism, asking questions of farmers, of policymakers, and he had a research project and an advocacy article with an angle. That's a local engagement. It illustrates that, that the student, through the area of academic interest, environmental public policy, is exploring his or her community, is investigating real issues, is developing real opinions based on facts, and understands how to research and solve problems. So we're always trying to localize our stories. And you can see the green box that there is a arrow pointing then to uh, a list. The list at the top says academic narrative engagement elements. Every time I, Quentin and I benchmark a college list, the first thing we do is we look at all those engagement evidence in the green box and we slot them into the categories you see on the where the arrow points. So you can see number one, introduction or impetus for interest. We need to understand how do your engagement experiences, the clubs you're part of, the summer programs you went to, how did that motivate your interest? Number two, the narrowing of their interest, right? You're interested in environmental public policy. Tell us how you became more interested. Narrow it a little, become more specific. Environmental public policy now becomes solar farming, right? It's a specific topic under environmental public policy. Number three, you see, is the expression of that narrowed interest through a deliverable. Maybe that's a research paper. Maybe that's an advocacy article. We want to show a piece of evidence that we are, in fact, engaged in exploring and interested. And then the fourth thing you see is objective achievement. And I wrote non-ED schools because the schools I mentioned that I think you need objective achievement for, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, and MIT, those five schools do not have early decision. Those are probably the most competitive five schools in the country. The schools just below that, Columbia, Cornell, Penn, I think you can be very successful. I know you can be successful without objective achievement. And then at the bottom, you see an engagement review grade. I ask myself, Quentin's asks himself all the time, how many academic narrative engagement elements do we have? How strong is the evidence of each element? That is fundamentally important to knowing whether or not a student can be successful in the application process. When a guidance counselor in 11th grade says, oh yeah, look at your SATs, look at your grades, you can apply to X school. That is a misguided perception. They don't have the full understanding of what actually is being evaluated. What they just evaluated is the bar of entry. Yes, you are at the level to be considered. The rest of the decision is based upon the things that you're seeing on the screen right here. So going back to what John mentioned earlier about the difference between a well-rounded and a focused student, I wanted to highlight some key differences between the two. So here is an example um, of two real student profiles. Both students' SAT scores were exactly the same at 1480, and both students had the exact same number of AP courses, which were seven. They both applied to Johns Hopkins one year apart, and they both applied as public health majors, but were originally positioned as pre-med students. So the first student who was accepted aimed for an environmental public health focus, which can be seen through the engagements that they participated in. There's the Science Olympiad. Uh, they served as the VP of the Environmental Awareness Club. They performed environmental health research in the local community health bureau. And then they also researched didn't the independent research project about the wa water quality and super fun sites. So from these examples, are there any like connections or, fl or flow that you can see between each of them? Um, they kind of really have this theme or connection of environmental public health. Everything's connected to this narrative that this student has really been engaged in these activities and that they have contributed or developed their interest in environmental public health, which is a very niche and focused subject area. You can already, you can like almost already track how this student got interested in the subject. So they went from like this club and then they developed an interest in the environment here. And then they search for more specific engagements that tied to public health and environment through the research later on. So now let's take a look at the other student who was waitlisted. They applied as a public health major, but was positioned more as a well-rounded student, as you can see from the engagements, which are a bit all over the place. The student also participated in the Science Olympiad. Um, they did some local hospital shadowing, which is more of a pre-med focus rather than a public health, um, which is also the case for the biology-focused wet lab research. Then there's some volunteer experience with Habitat for Humanity, but that doesn't really connect too well to the public health narrative. 
there's a way to maybe creatively spin that to fit a public health story with a bit more context from other public health engagements. But unfortunately, there's not a whole lot to help bolster that story. And the rest of the engagements like peer tutoring, captain of the tennis and fencing team, um, and playing the piano, there are much more general activities. Now, there's no like real issue with these activities, but it's if you just have those, they don't contribute much to the whole story of why the student is interested in public health. Everything with this student is a bit more all over the place. Do you see the difference? There's the focused engagement that illustrates the depth of interest and exp exploration. Um, and even if the well-rounded student has better grades, the focused student has a better chance of developing a compelling academic narrative. So I'm just going to, uh, before we go into the next slide here, I just want to tell you a, a short story about what Quentin just kind of shared with you about building a story that the reader can understand and making it connect to the institution. Um, last year, last year now, yes, I had a young lady who came to us in 11th grade. Very smart young lady. She had very good grades, strong standardized test scores. Um, and she said that she really wanted to go to Wharton School of Business to study finance. Quentin and I went through all of her experiences and we looked at how she spent her time. And the truth was that she just didn't have much that illustrated a true experience that was oriented towards business. So we looked at what she spent most of her time doing. And most of what she spent her time doing was volunteerism through um, a Girl Scout program. She was a Girl Scout. She was going to be doing a Gold Scout project. She wanted to go to Wharton School of Business for finance. And the one thing that she had done that kind of fit that storyline was uh, she was going to build a kind of personal finance program as part of her gold project for, um, for Girl Scouts. When I asked her, how did you spend most of your time as a Girl Scout? She said, you know, I volunteered a lot at a homeless shelter. That was kind of like the focus of her volunteers. So Quentin and I put our heads together and we asked ourselves, you know, um, how can we position this experience of volunteerism at the homeless shelter? Like, you know, that's where she's spending most of her time. What do we do with it? We asked her, number one, would you be okay with going to the University of Pennsylvania, not Wharton, arts and sciences economics? She said, yeah. I said, okay, I think that we can make a stronger case there. So Quentin and I got together and we started kind of building this story. What did we do? First, we asked ourselves, what is a homeless shelter, right? Within the context of economics, because that's what she wanted to, to build under. So homeless shelter is simply a physical manifestation of policy, right? That says that as a community, we would rather fund this shelter than have people be homeless in our community. We think this is a good public economic decision. So we've kind of positioned her volunteerism under what we refer to as public economics, an experience of volunteerism that explored a public economic entity or policy and uh, the manifestation of, of, of uh, policy, if you will. Okay, that's part one. We've positioned her experience. Now, you know, as I say to our students, our team, what makes for a good story? A good story usually has an issue, right? So we are now looking for an issue around housing in her community. So we're Googling, right? Homelessness in her community. Are there any news articles that come up? Nothing came up right away. But when we Googled low-income housing, article pops up. And that article basically was a debate in, in this young lady's community. The debate was, should we build a low-income housing structure in this community? And should we publicly subsidize the building of that? I said to the young lady, okay, that's an issue, right? 50% of the people in her community wanted them to build the low-income housing project because there was not enough affordable housing. Another 50% said, we don't want to build this. It's going to bring in low-income people, right? So there's tension in, in the community as to whether or not they should move forward. That makes for a good story. So now we have volunteerism at a, uh, a homeless shelter, and we have an issue in the community around housing. I said to the young lady, okay, we have an issue. Do you think that in your community you should build the low-income housing structure? She said, well, you know, I think absolutely we should. You know, it, it, we need more affordable housing. And I said, okay, but this isn't like a charity conversation, right? This is an economic question for your community. Is it a good economic decision for your community to build the low-income housing project? And she said, of course, I have no idea. 
just like probably the people who actually proposed it don't know. Now we have a question, a real question, a researchable question. What is the impact of a low-income housing project on a community like this if it's subsidized by X percent? I then take that young lady and I connect her to mentors in the space. They refine that question, make sure it's researchable by a high school student in two to six months, depending on how long we have. And they will help get that student from research question to a finding. Her research question was, what is the impact of a public, publicly subsidized low-income housing community? And is it short-term uh, positive impact, short-term negative impact? Her findings were short-term negative impact. There's an outlay of public dollars. Long-term positive impact, because once you give someone a roof, they can possibly get a job, a bank account, et cetera, and you can increase your tax base. Whether that's true or not, that was her finding. So remember, we have a volunteer experience at a homeless shelter. We now have a research experience with a finding that illustrates that a low-income housing structure has short-term negative impact, long-term positive impact. We go back to the issue, right? We go back to that issue where people are not sure. Should we build it? Should we not? And we say, based upon my volunteerism in a homeless shelter where I saw firsthand the needs of our community, and based upon the findings of my academic research that indicated short-term we might have a negative economic impact, but long-term we're going to benefit. I think we should build that low-income housing project. And now that young lady is writing articles to her school newspaper, her local newspaper, and because she wanted to go to an Ivy League school like Penn, she also went to a local council meeting and she verbally shared her findings. Her mother took a video of her while she was sharing those findings. We took the link to the article she wrote. We took the link to the video of her speaking. We took the link to the research abstract that she created. We put all of that into the application. In a relatively short period of time, you take a volunteer experience at a, at a um, homeless shelter that if you don't use it appropriately, no one cares about it. You know, if you volunteer at a, at a um, soup kitchen and this story isn't about food insecurity, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't land. But if you volunteer at a homeless shelter and your story is about housing scarcity, now it lands. Now it matters. So we take a volunteer experience that no one really cares about. We position it and make it important. We develop a research question that pulls in that experience, and we make sure that we're investigating a relevant community issue so that we can weigh in on the community question when we're done. That young lady gets admitted to Penn and would be admitted, she was admitted, and she would have been admitted almost everywhere she applied because colleges want to see students who can identify problems in their community, investigate those problems, and hopefully implement research-oriented solutions to those problems. So hopefully that story gives you just a little bit of insight in how we kind of build a story around common experiences. Now let's fast forward for just a moment to application time. The next step on your journey is to determine how to best use your engagement experiences to inform which perspective major or overall story makes the most strategic sense at the specific college or university that you're considering. This is critical in your juncture for deciding, it is important that you understand the competitiveness of the decisions you're making. I've, decisions were just released for Cornell and most of the rest of the Ivy League on the 15th. I've had many phone calls from students who have not got in, not my clients, of course, right? But students who have not got in. Almost every single one of them, I know this is hard to believe, every single one of them, when I look at what they did, they applied to the wrong programs. Their evidence does not support what they say they're interested in. Students think they can just apply to a business program, apply to a bio program. You cannot do that unless you have legitimate evidence in those spaces. Okay. It's also important to understand that colleges and universities are incredibly complex. If you wanted to study, let's just say you wanted to go to medical school and you wanted to study biology as the undergraduate major to go to medical school, and you decided that you wanted to go to Cornell University. Number one, what college at Cornell would you apply to? You can see on the screen, there are three colleges you could apply to. You could apply to arts and sciences. You could apply to agriculture and life sciences. You could apply to human ecology. All three of those colleges have pre-med programs. They are fundamentally different as it relates to the competitiveness of getting in. They're not fundamentally different in regards to the experience of the student when they get there. They're competitive 
they're, they're different because of how hard it is to get into each one. So number one, before you ever decide what your prospective major is at a place like Cornell, you have to choose your prospective college. And if you choose the wrong college, number one, because your evidence doesn't support it, or number two, you choose one that's more competitive than another, you very may well lower your chances rather significantly. And then if you choose the right college, right? Say you choose the College of Arts and Sciences, what prospective major would you choose in the College of Arts and Sciences as someone that wants to go to medical school? Well, there are a lot of different ones you could choose. You could choose biology, of course, but you could do sociology, you could environment sustainability, psychology, science and technology, anthropology, sociology, psychology. There's a million different directions you could go. And each one of those at the undergraduate level would have a different level of competitiveness to actually getting into Cornell to get there, right? You pick bio versus if you pick anthropology, the, the difference of you getting in would be drastic. Anthropology would be way easier. So the point here is, is that you have many choices to make before you ever write an essay. And it is important that you've thought about these things in advance, because if you have not, what you'll find is when you write that essay, you're writing it to the wrong college with the wrong evidence. And if you apply to the wrong college with the wrong evidence, you have no chance. And when you hear stories about highly competitive students, strong students with great grades and strong SATs that don't get in, either they don't have a story, which is a lot of students. But even if you don't have a story, sometimes you can get in without a story, but you will never get in without a story if you're applying to the wrong college. And you'd be shocked how many times a business student applies to arts and sciences, economics, wrong college, not getting in. And a, an engineering student applies to arts and sciences, wrong college, not getting in. Or they apply to the right college with a super competitive area, and thus they also don't get in. So this is really important if you don't understand it, please jot down some questions and we can answer them for you later on. I wanted to give you uh, an idea here. What you're seeing on screen is what I refer to as the student's application portfolio. Uh, the reason I wanted to show you this is this is what we create right before the student is about to apply to college. The portfolio is an overview of the way the student has spent their time and their experiences. That overview illustrates to me and to my team what the possible options are of how they apply to college. We need to know how do they spend their time and what areas of academia those experiences fall under. And we need to understand how we plan to use them as evidence. If we do that well, the stories come to life. If you do it poorly, the stories fall flat. It is very important that everyone knows the story. When I say the story, that application story you can't have a student writing an essay and have a guidance counselor who doesn't know the story or a teacher that doesn't know the story. For example, if you ever write on an application, free advice, you know, if you don't ever hire a consultant, if you ever write pre-med on an application, you will lower your chances rather significantly. It's the hardest way to apply to college. It's not a good decision. You don't need to be pre-med to be pre-med when you get there. So free advice, don't ever write that down, okay? Imagine for a moment that you know that, right? You're working with myself or Quentin, or you just heard this presentation and you know that applying pre-med would be problematic. So you do everything you can to make sure that you don't sound pre-med. You decide to apply public health, which would be a good decision. And you do all of the engagement that makes sense for public health and you write the essays really well, you're ready to go. One day, your teacher who thinks that, thinks very highly of you, thinks he or she is doing you a favor, writes in your letter of recommendation. You know, Johnny will make a great physician one day. Game over. If you told them in the application that you were not pre-med, you did the right thing, you tried to pretend in theory that you like public health, which would be a good decision from a competitiveness perspective, but your teacher says you are pre-med by saying you want to become a physician, that's it. You will not get into a highly selective school. That disconnect between what your teacher says and what you say is a big problem. So it is very important that everyone, teacher, guidance counselor, student, and parent, because they're often writing brag sheets, sharing information with teachers and guidance counselors about their children. It's important that everyone is on the same page so that when the reader sits down to read, everything lines up, they're getting a consistent story, and thus they understand how and what you will add to their specific community. That is really important. This is part one, the application portfolio. 
Part two is what I refer to as the supplemental essay research template. This is just a random page of a supplemental essay research template. Why do we create supplemental essay research templates? Well, we have the portfolio. That's what we just looked at. That's the student information. Now we need to know the institutional information, right? We need to understand how does the experiences of the student connect to Cornell? How does it connect to Columbia? How does it connect to Penn? That's the research template. That's my team going through and asking, based on the student's experiences, what classes should they note in their essays? What clubs should they note in their essays? What types of research are they doing at that university that coincides or is synergistic with the research that the student did? We go through to make sure that the student has both pieces of the puzzle before they ever sit down to write. Portfolio, representative of the student experience, research template, representative of the institutional opportunity. Once the student has both of those pieces and has a meeting with us, right, to kind of go through the question and how to use those pieces, they are now ready to sit down and build a compelling supplemental essay for college. Applying to college for the parents here, this is like applying for a job. Imagine for a moment that you're applying, you know, as a student, you're applying to become a lifeguard. If you happen to be a really strong swimmer, you could argue that you are very qualified to become a lifeguard. But if you never look at the position description, the description of what they actually want from you, if that position description says you need to be CPR certified and you're not, you don't get the job. In our situation, right, we're not applying for a job, we're applying to college. We don't have a position description, we have a departmental description, biology, computer science, sociology, engineering, right? We have departmental descriptions. That is our position description. We want to know what is happening in those departments. Our job is to make sure that if we know what's happening in those departments, we know the research, we know the classes, we know the clubs, that the things that the student is doing in high school is building evidence that supports the idea that the student is ready to contribute in that department when it's time. They can contribute in the class because of X, Y, and Z experiences. They can contribute in research because of X, Y, and Z experiences. Our job is to build a student, an application like they're applying for a job. Because in the end, if we can identify the synergies between your academic story and the things you've done and the opportunities and ethos of the college slash university you're applying to, you will earn offers of admission. You will be admitted to top tier schools. But it's important that you plan in advance. You cannot decide this. Certainly you can't do it the year you're applying. And it's hard to do it the year before you're applying. You really do need a, enough time to build the appropriate evidence for the appropriate prospective major to give yourself the absolute best shot to get into a top tier school. Okay, finally, before we jump into probably the most important part of this Q&A, I know that, you know, I talk a lot, I talk fast, we'll slow down, we'll answer your questions. I want to just briefly uh, talk about my partnership with Ivy Compass. One of the things that is really important to me, I love working with students. I love developing strategies, helping young capable school students reach new heights. In an effort to improve my product, to improve, increase my capacity, I was looking for a while for an organizational structure that could provide resources and infrastructure for my team. I found that in Ivy Compass. That's why I do that. So what you'll find is that we have great language support if English is not um, first language or parents don't speak English. Sometimes the students do, parents don't. Ivy Compass provides great language support for me as I don't speak Chinese. Uh, also enhanced parental engagement. You know, I give students very clear directives in our meetings about what they need to do. Most students that want to go to top tier schools act on that and they're successful. But sometimes students need to have their hand held and we pulled along a little bit. The Ivy Compass team makes sure that they are engaging with the parents to make sure that no one's getting left behind. And then the final part is the robust academic resources. I am a college admissions consultant. I don't provide, you know, I don't help the students do the research, right? I give them ideas about how to take their experiences, turn it into compelling research questions, connect them to the right mentors. So many of the resources that I'm connecting students to exist under the Ivy Compass umbrella, and that's why I've partnered with them there. So if you have questions about my partnership with Ivy Compass, feel free to let us know. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for your time and energy listening to 
Quentin and I, uh, we look forward to taking your questions if, if now is appropriate. Um, well, I, I assume you're talking about like extra uh, courses that are non-required, I think, is that what we're asking? You know, basically what I would say is that curriculum, everything that you've taken, whether it's a core class or not, that will be listed in your, obviously in your transcript. And you also list it on the common app of the classes you're taking. All of that matters. You need good grades at top tier schools at every single class. Of course, if you're going to apply to a STEM field, they're going to be focused on math sequencing. But in the end, everything you do in high school from an academic perspective will be noted on the Common App. And if you take anything outside of school, you know, uh, dual enrollment classes or community college or something else, that would also be noted. I, I'm not sure if that answered the question. But. Okay. And, like, and that, goes, that goes for AP tests, too. If a student yes. takes an AP test outside of um, what they're actually taking. Correct. Good point. Good point. Okay. All right. If if uh, August, if we did not answer your question, you feel free to unmute yourself and then raise a hand, and we can let you to clarify the question you are asking. Okay. This is for Cindy Lu asking: Is this specific to the first year of application? How does the second year transfer dif differ from what it is being discussed? But are you talking, Cindy? Are you talking about one of the specific John's uh, slides presentation she made? Uh, he made. I think we understand the question. Okay. Yeah, I, I think to, um, I guess I'll just quickly weigh in on that, saying that basically I would say there is no real difference. Uh, you would want exactly the same level of engagement experience in a very specific academic area uh, if you were applying as a transfer. I will say as a transfer, depending on school, it can be a lot easier. Now, it is important to recognize that not all schools that have transfer applications have real transfer processes. So if you see a school, it's hard to find this, but if you look at the data and you see they're admitting 10 or 15 transfers, that's not a real process usually. You know, they're admitting athletes and stuff like that, so it's not real. But if you see 50 or 100 transfers, that's usually a real process. And that means that it's a viable strategy to apply as a transfer to those schools. And you would basically need exactly the same stuff. It's important to note that you really can't transfer into like computer science, right? You can't go from NYU to Cornell as a computer science student, but you could go from NYU to Cornell as a economic student, right? So it's important. Transfer is a little different. It provides some opportunities, but it can also be tricky if you don't understand exactly how it works. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, this question is from a Wang. Can these students apply for multiple majors in one university? If yes, is it a all-in-one application or separate multiple applications? If it is an individual application, is it be reviewed by different admission officer? Good question. So when you apply, let's just say we'll use an example, we apply to Penn. Um, you can only apply to one college, right? So you can't apply to Wharton and Arts and Sciences. So that's question number one. What college are you applying to? And there's only one you cannot be considered by multiples. Part two is the prospective major that you noted. In theory, you could put down multiple majors because that's not, you're not being admitted to the major, it's your prospective major. And so, you know, if I apply to the arts and sciences college and I'm interested in economics and interested in psychology, I can put both down. What does that mean? Well, they're not admitting you to economics, they're not admitting you to psychology. They would now be reading your lens, your application with a lens of psychology and economics. Is that a good thing? It could be. Is it a bad thing? It could be. It depends on what your evidence is and how competitive those areas are. So the answer to your question is you can only apply to one college at a university at a time, but you could in theory identify multiple prospective majors. That would all be read by the same, Cornell is probably the only uh, unique example of this in that each college at Cornell has its own admission staff, own director, own team. That's very atypical. Most universities, total university has one admission staff they read for all applications. So whether you applied as a bio major or you know, an English major would have no impact on who reads it. Who reads it is usually based on region, where you live. So uh, hopefully that answered your question on kind of both sides of that. I don't know if I missed any parts. Uh, Quentin, did I miss anything that you would add? I will say like sometimes, yeah, there's, there's strategic benefit in applying to more than one major. Um, I'm just thinking of students that we've worked with um, we'll have a student be a nutrition major, but also they have an interest in public policy. So those two combine are actually very strong together because it's very niche. 
Um, and it very much separates them from most other applicants because most applicants won't be applying as both in nutrition and public policy. That's a more specific um, double multi interdisciplinary um, subject. Right. But it's important to note that, right, we make those decisions based on evidence, right? So we right. look at, oh, wow, there's food oriented stuff. That's nutrition. Oh, there's policy oriented stuff. Now we put that together and make that decision. And it does become very powerful, but you can't just kind of randomly choose majors. Right. Uh, you know, just in case somebody might might have misunderstood that. Okay. Excellent answer. Thank you, John and Quentin. Very, very good answer. Uh, this one, thanks for our host, Gracie. Gracie asking a very, very good question. We uh, we facing that all the time. Uh, what are your advice to students who may not have a focused interest at high school? <laughs> that's the number one, right? that's like the number one challenge. And I think, you know, just to be clear, I don't, think that students in high school should be making decisions about the rest of their lives. I know they're young, right? And we want them to explore. The problem is that when students start to build stories, and some do, and you don't, you fall behind. You will not have as in-depth of a story. You will not get to as strong a school. So what do we do? You know, every single time I meet with a student, the first question I always ask them is, do you guys have an idea of the type of college yet? Business, engineering, arts, and sciences. If the answer is no, I have no idea, then I start with engineering and business. And I say to them, are you interested in business at all? If the answer is yes, you need to go to some summer program, something to orient yourself to what is business, what is finance, what is economics, what's micro, what's macro. We don't need to know what you want to do it for the rest of your life. We simply need to know, is it still on the list? Same thing with engineering. Are you interested in engineering? If not, if you're not sure, you need to go to a program that introduces you to mechanical, electrical, whatever it is, get that hands-on experience and come back and say, is it still on the list? Yes or no. At a young age, the first thing, the only thing I really care about is identifying the type of college, engineering, business, or arts and sciences. If they come back and they say, I don't really need engineering. I don't think that's it. I don't want to focus on business. Then I'm left with arts and sciences and that's everything else. Now, at that stage, let's say they're in ninth grade and I'm stuck um, with arts and sciences, and they say, you know, I don't know, John, I don't know what I want to study. Well, then I'll break it down into the three areas. Are you interested in humanities, you know, English and writing and history? Are you interested in social sciences, psychology, sociology, anthropology? Are you interested in STEM areas, biology, chemistry, physics? If they know, then great. That's an area that we can start to kind of start to build ideas around. If they don't know, then I give them a period of time. I say to the student and the family, you know, depending on what kind of general leanings they have, at some point when you don't decide, you start to get behind. Right? Imagine for a moment, we'll just use Quentin as an example. There are two versions of Quentin. They're both in ninth grade, Quentin A and Quentin B, you know, same academic ability, same stats. Quentin A decides in ninth grade, I'm going to apply to college as an economic student. Quentin B decides in 11th grade, he's going to apply as an economic student. Quentin B cannot win. You know, it's almost impossible because two full years of evidence has been created for Quentin A about economics and Quentin B has been broadly exploring and doesn't have that. So what do I do with students? I often will say, listen, I recognize you can't make a decision and we're not deciding what you want to do for the rest of your life. We're simply asking, how do you want to explore for the next year or two or three in high school? So if you can't make a decision, I'll make one for you. And if you change your mind, if you feel like that's not a good decision, of course, communicate that. But no decision is, in fact, the worst decision you can make. You've got to make some decision about how you plan to apply. Um, if a student changes their mind, they start in ninth grade, Quentin A says economics. 11th grade, Quentin A says, you know what? I hate economics. I don't want to do that. I want biology. Well, then we have to ask ourselves a question. Is it too late? Is it too late to change the way you apply? Not, is it too late to go to medical school? You know, we're not going to say, hey, Quentin, sorry, you want to become a physician. It's too late. You're in 11th grade, right? That would be silly. It's not too late for that. It's too late to change the way you apply to college. You can apply as an economic student because you have evidence. When you get there, since economics exists in the same college as biology, arts and sciences, you can declare biology when you get there. It'd be a very poor decision to switch your major and your perspective major at that moment and say, well, you know what? I love biology forget economics, I'm now going to apply as a biology student because you would have students, your competition will have had two years of biology evidence building that you don't have and you won't win. Does that make sense? Is that answer your question, Gracie? 
Yeah, yeah. I guess um, <laughs> what you're talking about is really like you know, um, find something in the ninth grade. Um, and just try to um, I do see some students um, at least in my community, they are late bloomers, right? They they're just not mature yet at the ninth grade. Um, so maybe by the eleventh grade, right? That's where they are still without a much more focused area. How do you help those students to build an essay or resume, you know, for their college application? Well, you know, it's a great question that the, the areas of academia are not created equal as it relates to how hard it is to get in. So if a student's in 11th grade and they come to me, let's just say they have no evidence, they've done nothing, you know, they've just been playing video games for the last couple of years, but they have good grades, good SAT scores. If they said to me, well, John, I really would like to apply as a, you know, let's just say biology student, it's too late. You won't be able to compete no matter what you do, no matter how good your grades are. You can't apply to an Ivy League school with no evidence up through 11th grade and be successful. So what we do is we ask ourselves, you know, in ninth grade, you could in theory do anything, right? Even the highly competitive areas of computer science. It wouldn't be a great idea to do computer science as the way you apply, but you could, right? Uh, you could do biology pre-med. It wouldn't be a great idea, but you could because you have enough time to build that evidence. In 11th grade, some of those doors would be closed, right? It's just, you're not going to get in if you apply that way. So now we have to talk, oftentimes shift to the social sciences where you can create evidence a lot faster and you can kind of connect, create the connections a lot faster. And I've been very successful doing that. And then the students will declare what they want when they get there. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing when what they love and the strategic way to apply to college is the same thing. But oftentimes it's not the same thing. And so we kind of have two things happening at the same time in high school. Thank we you. have the issue with CS students, as we, we've recently learned through our past, this past <laughs> application cycle. It's it's very, very, very competitive CS. Um, would recommend maybe taking some other tangentially related um, direction instead of going directly th into CS. And I'll just add on to what Quentin just said, you know, like we, we just finished decisions and basically every single student that I've had that has been admitted for the most, every single student who has not been admitted, which is very few, they've been in that space. You know, they're in CS, they're Asian male students, demographics and academic direction are deciding factors in college admissions. And so it's really important to recognize that you could be one of the best students around. And if you have the wrong demographics, and the wrong prospective major, they might not even read your app. They say they do, of course, right? But they might not read it, or they read it with a lens where you have no real chance. So it's, um, I just want to take one step back and, and say one last thing about this. I have, this is a fundamental question, and it's probably for a lot of people in the audience, for their children. And we ask this all the time. You know, they come to us and they're in coding club. They love Python, right? They, they do these things. They're clearly computer science. They like it. There's no reason to think that that's not what they want to do. And they have the background and the skill set and the math background to do it. And we have to ask them, do you want to suspend your interest in computer science for a year and start to build evidence in another area? Or do you want to move forward with computer science and apply in that space? And the students, almost 100% of them, they want to stay in computer science. They don't want to spend their time doing anything that's outside of what they want to do. And I understand that. So if they're young, we can make minor adjustments that usually work. But if they're older and they have legitimate CS experiences and you can't really shift them, then they have to ask themselves, do I continue with this, right? Computer science. And I recognize I'm going to end up going to a lower level school or do I literally shift the types of things I'm doing in high school to build a story? It's a question. And it's a hard question for a lot of students, but it's a question that has to be asked and you have to do it eyes wide open. You can't just be like, you know, oh, well, I just I just continued doing that. You have to make a strategic, yes, I know it's more competitive. I don't care. It's worth it. Or I know it's more competitive. It's it's worth it for me to push that aside so I can get to an Ivy League level school. Yeah. Everything, the decision you make, uh, there's a consequences. As long as you're okay with the consequences, then, then it's okay to make that decision to left or right, right? Um, Sometimes we have to respect the children's heart as well. Okay, Definitely. next question is also very good from Chan Ni. Are computer science and electric, uh, electrical engineering considered the same college? 
if the student aim at CS or EE as their goal, what should the student do in general to build a good story? It's a very good question. It's one of the things you'll, you'll find, which makes this so difficult, is that universities are not structured the same way. So the answer to your question is, it depends on what institution we're talking about. Some schools have engineering, and underneath engineering in that engineering college is where they have computer science only. Some schools have it that way. I would say that's more rare than typical. But some schools have engineering college, and then they have computer science, computer engineering, electrical engineering, all that type of stuff there. Most schools have computer science in both spots. So if you look at Penn, you look at Cornell, computer science is a major in engineering, and it's a major in arts and sciences. Um, in regards to, so, so you have a choice there, and, and they are not the same, and it's important to kind of differentiate those depending on which direction you go. So in regards to kind of like if we're on the engineering side, um, I would say computer science is not the same as electrical engineering. I mean, they're similar, but you know, in between there generally would be computer engineering. So it's kind of like computer science, computer engineering, electrical engineering. Uh, and that's why on the software side of computer science is closer to arts and sciences usually depending on the institution. In regards to like, how do you build a, a good story? Um, you know, building an engineering story is different than building an arts and sciences story. And, you know, in, in engineering, there's kind of two different directions you can go. You can actually build something, right? You can identify a problem in, you know, whether that's in your community or otherwise, and you could build something to solve that problem. Um, or you can do research in the, in the space that you're engaged in. So you can do computer science research on neomorphic computing structures if you want it. Most of the time when we talk about engineering essays, right, we're, what we're, we're not talking about like I took this piece of hardware and put it together with that piece of hardware, right? We're talking about the process of problem solving, right? How did I identify the problem? Who did I speak to to identify the intricacies of the problem? What research did I do to think about the potential solutions? How did I then implement those solutions? So it's really about, you know, how do I build a good story? It depends on the area of engineering. It depends on exactly what type of research the student was doing but it's really about kind of intellectualizing the process of solving problems in engineering. And there's lots of kind of different projects that could serve as the platform to do that. It's a general question, but it's a pretty complex question to answer simply. Yeah, um, thank you, John. The follow-up question is, for example, what research or internship do you recommend a student do for prospective CS or EE, double E major student? You know, um, as it relates to electrical engineering, that I means see, perspective CS and perspective electrical engineering, in my opinion, are not similar. Um, perspective CS, obviously, you can do a lot of software-oriented stuff. Electrical engineering, you, you don't really do that. Electrical engineering, you're going to see a lot of robotics-oriented engagement experiences. You kind of have to have that type of stuff. CS, you don't necessarily have to have that. So they're not exactly the same thing. Um, you know, in regards to kind of like what types of research or internships you would do, I mean, in CS, there's a million different ones. I mean, we have students that have done internships right now at the NIH that are CS, that have done the FDA that are CS, that are doing, you know, machine learning algorithms, that are reviewing, you know, uh, I mean, you know, that using data and information science to explore health, right? So there's lots of different ways to explore with computer science. Um, it could be an internship, it could be, you know, usually it's like internship plus research, and hopefully they're connected so that we kind of have a cohesive story. Electrical engineering, computer engineering, mechanical engineering, any like project-oriented engineering uh, storylines, those are usually fundamentally different and they're usually built on actual projects. My best case scenario for engineers is we have an actual community engineering project. So I had a student last year who did um, was mechanical engineering and uh, one of the local universities had a community engineering program. He joined it and they built a ramp, you know, literally built a ramp for someone who had been in an accident in their community. And they, we wrote essays about you know, identifying who in the group had different skill sets and how they did the measuring and how they identified the materials. And that was the storyline. It was a community engineering project. I had another student who was computer science and mechanical engineering who, you know, he came to me, he said, John, I want to do a project. You know, he said, he said, give me an idea. I said, I don't know. You know, there's a million things you could do, right? You live in, this student lived in Canada. I said, so, you know, you got to give me an idea of like, what are the options out there? I said, what do you do after school? He said, I go to my grandma's orchard. I said, okay. I said, go to the orchard and start asking some questions. So we jotted down interview questions. You know, what's the most annoying part of your day if you're the orchard picker, right? What if you had unlimited resources, 
how would you spend those resources if you're the person who owns the orchard, which happened to be his grandmother, right? So he goes to the orchard and he interviews people. And what he found was that one of the most time-consuming and expensive aspects of the orchard was identifying whether or not the fruit was ready to be picked. They literally would have to walk up and down these aisles, I guess, to identify it. So he identified that as a problem through interviewing people. Then he came back to me and he said, what should I do with that? And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an engineer. I said, I'm an emissions consultant, but I can imagine, right, that an engineer with you could solve that, to come up with some ideas, at least to solve that problem. So he met with an engineering uh, mentor and the engineering mentor and him brainstormed a solution where a drone would fly by the trees, the apple trees, and would take pictures. And then basically they used a machine learning algorithm that would identify whether the apples were right and predict how soon they would be ripe. Now, his grandmother owned the orchard, right? So it wasn't like, you know, he got into a commercial orchard here. His grandmother got him in, but they seemed to work. And he decided then to go to another orchard. I think his grandmother had a friend, right? And the orchard owner there thought that was also a good idea. So then he had another drone flying by. So we write, wrote all of our essays around the process of identifying the problem, the brainstorming of the solution, and the business implementation of his engineering solution. He was admitted pretty much everywhere. So there are a million different ways to do it. That's just one example of how you might do an organic engineering project that explores a real problem that you identify through investigation. Good, thank you, John. Okay, next question is pretty pretty long uh, in regard to pre-med uh, from Wang. If a student is interested in pre-med but cannot get access to research opportunity in that field, does doing research in another STEM field, such as engineering, still benefit their application or make them look unfocused? For example, could they participate in research about greenhouse gas emissions and tie that into a pre-med narrative? You also mentioned not explicitly saying you are pre-med because of how competitive it is. What majors could be optimal then? So... I know I'm talking a lot. I don't know, Quentin, if you want to jump in, you feel free. If I miss anything, you let me know. But I'll take this one. I guess what I would say would be it's important to recognize pre-med is not a major. It's a track. There's no college that has pre-med as a major. And just like, you know, uh, pre-law is not a major. It's a track to go to law school. Those are professional degree programs, law school, medical school. And so point number one that's important to recognize is that the colleges, the undergraduate schools, do not care that you want to go to medical school. That's not what they're evaluating. They don't have a medical school at the undergraduate school you're applying to. They have an undergraduate bio program. They have an undergraduate chemistry program, right? But they don't have a pre-med. And so I, I would encourage you, if, if you want to go to medical school, that's great. That's a nice long-term goal. It is irrelevant, in my opinion, as it relates to you applying to undergraduate college. Now, if there's any level of relevance, it's that it happens to be your area of interest, right? Medicine or health, if you will. And so in high school, students want to explore what they're interested in. And so they say, well, I want a story. I want to explore medicine or pre-med, even though it's not an undergraduate thing they can apply to. My suggestion would be that they explore something that, number one, is not nearly as competitive. And number two, is something they can apply to. They could apply to bio. That's what most pre-med students do. Highly competitive, very difficult to differentiate yourself. You do want research, but your research will be evaluated based on generally objective achievement or findings. Right? What did you actually find in your research? That's hard to stand out in that space. Almost every pre-med student we have, we ship them to public health. Free advice, you know, whether you apply to college, if you're thinking about applying as a pre-med student, cancel that idea right now and shift it to public health. Public health you walked into your high school as a student right now, went to the smartest kid in your high school that's applying pre-med and said, tell me about your local public health bureau. Most of them don't even know it exists. And if they know it exists, they don't know what's happening there. So it's a very nice area to build value because it's community oriented, it's health oriented, and most students don't know about it. It's also the social science version of pre-medicine, right? Like medicine is a STEM oriented conversation. Public health is an interdisciplinary area. You know, of course, it takes health into consideration, but it also takes into consideration economics, philosophy, ethics, sociology, anthropology, 
all that stuff is considered part of public health. How do communities make decisions that impact the health of a community? And so um, I would highly suggest that you apply to a College of Arts and Sciences as a public health major. If the student does, if the college doesn't have public health, which lots of universities don't, that doesn't matter. You say you're going to do an undergraduate experience that's like public health through a combination of interdisciplinary programs like sociology, economics, biology, et cetera. So that's why how you do it. I know it might not be the easiest thing to understand if you haven't put those programs together, but that's what gives you the advantage, right? Not many students can take sociology, biology, economics, and explain in an essay how a combination of courses in those areas could create a public health foundation. But if you can do it, you have a huge advantage and you're not competing with pre-med students and you will see admit rates are way higher in those spaces. Right, thank you. I know that's a lot of information there. Uh, I have two good questions. This one from Kathy, asking what college major are suitable for law degree later? That's that's simple, I'll just say any of them. Mm -hmm. just, just like an undergraduate, uh, they, they're not, they don't care that you wanna to go to law school. So I would suggest, you know, my dad is an attorney. I did lots of interning when I was in high school. I thought that mattered. They don't care about that. In fact, you know, it almost detracts a little from the application. So focus on the undergraduate majors that you could study. Most of them will do government, political science, international relations. But I would say if your goal is to get into law school, you know, everybody wants something different, right? So if, if you're applying to law school and you're a political science major, just like everybody else, it's tough. If you apply to law school and you're a, you know, let's just say you're a economics major, that's a little better. Let's just say you're a physicist, you know, maybe you don't, maybe a physicist isn't interested in law school, but if they were, that would be compelling because of the differentiation. So if that's your only goal is to get into law school, the more unique the major at the undergraduate level, the better. And I would ignore law school when I'm actually applying to college. Yeah, because I, I have my own friends who are in law school, school now, and they came from all different mm -hmm. backgrounds, history, business, philosophy. So literally pretty much, yeah, like John said, any major is uh, feasible. Like also a pre-med student too, right? Some of the pre-med students also can come in from English major. Mm -hmm. They can, but there is a core core curriculum requirement. So, you know, like the point is like the reason most of the students do bio is right because it's like they're getting the major requirement and right. The core. If you do English, then you basically have the English requirement plus that, so it's kind of like double. Right. But yes, the answer okay. to your question is you are correct. So. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is um, asking what any suggestion coming from LL, how to write a parent's brack sheets. Do you want to take, do you want to discuss the qualities and characteristics that we think are valuable in a parent brag sheet, Quentin? Um, and kind of like the curiosity, just kind of general overall stuff that we, that we do with brag sheets. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, having like those engagement engagement. So the uh, brag sheet. Sorry, just like the definition. Oh, well, yeah, we call them different things. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So basically, maybe when John we, answer that. Yeah, maybe yeah. Let me well, answer just because the brag sheet. I guess lots of schools call them different things. Right. Um, and and lots of them use them differently. When when I'm referring to a brag sheet, I think what the question is about is when the school guidance counselor or teacher sends home a document to the student or parent and says, "This is a, a document for you to brag about." yourself or your child. Tell us about the qualities and characteristics that you think are important. Tell us about the experiences that you think are important. When we do that, the reason maybe Quentin doesn't pop to his mind is because from my perspective, there's a very clear message that we tell all, this, all of the uh, students about brag sheets. The qualities that we care about are curiosity, explorative, and contributive, right? Curio curious, the students interested in the world around them. We need to identify that in their area of academic interest. How can we illustrate their curiosity? Second, explorative, right? You can be interested in something, but you've got to be out there in the world. How have you actually got out there and engaged in a variety of uh, environments to explore the thing you're curious about? And the final piece is contributive, right? Like you're out there, you're exploring, you're learning something. We want to illustrate to the reader that the purpose of all of this is to add something of value back to the community. Now, the details of how you do that, of course, are different from each student. You know, if it's an engineering student versus a political science student, those things will look different. But curious, explorative, and contributive are basically the qualities that we're trying to build through on the brag sheet. 
And we make sure, you know, basically our process is student writes it, parent writes it. And I review it to make sure that those qualities are there. If they're not there, then we're brainstorming where those, what types of stories could illustrate those qualities. Other than that, I kind of let the brag sheets roll because when, if you were to edit the brag sheet, that doesn't show up anywhere, right? It's like you're sending something that the teacher is now going to interpret and they're going to write. So like editing it is not something we generally do, but we give directional ideas to make sure the qualities are where they need to be. I will say like expanding on that, um, like I talked about in the previous slide that I covered between the more focused student and the more well-rounded student. Um, in those examples of the in their engagements, you can kind of track along like what got them initially interested in this subject and then like what was the next area of engagement that expanded upon their interest that maybe had a more specific um, impact or a more specific interest deeper into that like public health or or public environmental health policy they they had that research with the the local um, public health bureau so that's like a more in-depth engagement. So I think like following that path and explaining to the to the teacher or the whoever's writing the, the recommendation, this is where I started and this is how I kept going and got more and more further engaged in these subjects can really help like highlight um the path and the narrative that that, that student took. And I think that makes it easier for the for the teacher too to write their the recommendation letter because they have those specific details about what to include. Like, oh, this is this is what this student did and this is how they got there. Yeah, agreed. And I'll just add one last thing uh, before we move on is that, you know, oftentimes it's not that we're identifying what needs to go in the brag, brag sheet. It's more we're getting rid of the things that we don't want in the right. brag sheet. The qualities of like, you know, oh, my son is persistent. You know, he's loyal. He's organized. He's a hard worker. Those are not qualities that matter, that move the needle in any way. You know, we know you're organized enough to get good grades. We know you're a hard enough worker to get good grades, right? They don't care if you're loyal. They don't care if you're persistent, quite frankly, you know, persistent in something that you care about. They want to see, of course, because that's the only way to achieve something. But persistence just blindly doesn't work. So what we're focused on is making sure that, you know, the qualities are leading the reader to a decision that actually uh, provides an opportunity for them to understand what they're adding to their community. And, you know, if you put hard work or you put organized, that won't work. Serious, explorative, contributive, that works. And we got to make sure the stories represent that. Okay, great. Uh, now it's 1049 and thank you both of you hard worker. We still have 179 people online waiting to hear both of you. And next question, maybe Quentin, you can ask, I, I saw two people raise that question is, what year is a good year for people to hire a college application counselor? The earlier, the better. <laughs> the earlier, the better, because it makes it so much easier for us to work with the student from the beginning of the app, like from, the beginning of their high school experience than to rather work with them just in their senior year. Um, just because it's so much easier to start brainstorming with the student, um, fleshing out their interest early on, and then it, building that narrative as early as possible. Cause it's just so much more clear in the application, like the path, the journey that the student took when you start with them earlier. So I would say the earlier, the better. Great. Yes. Very good. Very good answer. We see that as well. When they come to you, 11th grade, uh, I think put both of you a very tough, <laughs> tough spot, very challenging You have to do area. a lot of creative manipulation sometimes with some students. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see that. I think for all parties, for, it's it's a hard for the student, it's a hard for the college counselor, it's a hard for both of you to, to really helping them to crunch the time, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not enough time to do everything. Uh, obviously, put the student in the disadvantaged spot as well. Right. OK, um, from Ellen um, asking a question, could you comment on how to prepare a, uh, to get into the top business school for undergraduate undergraduate student? Yeah, that's a good one. You know, um, at the outset, when a student's interested in business and they're young, the first question that I always ask them is how strongly are you? interested in business? How sure are you? How, how, how much do you know about business, right? Usually undergrad, uh, high school students don't know a whole lot because high school really isn't built around that. The curriculum isn't, the extracurricular activities are not really built that way. STEM areas are a little more so. So at a young age, most of them aren't, aren't super, super sure. Maybe sometimes their parents are a little more sure that business would be the right direction for them. 
And then when I share with them that not all the top schools have undergraduate business programs, you know, like Harvard doesn't have undergraduate finance, um, then oftentimes parents will say, well, let's let's take a step back. Do we definitely want to build a business story? 98% of the time I build what I refer to as public economic stories. And public economic stories are basically stories that will be flexible enough that if you decide you want to apply to a business school like Wharton or, St- or Stern, you can do it. And if you decide you want to apply to an arts and sciences college under economics, you can do it. If you build a finance story, you know, your stocks and stuff, that will work in theory for a business school, although it's not a good story for that either. But it definitely will not work for an arts and sciences story. So the first question that I would be asking, you know, Alan here would be, are we 100% sure we want business? If it's 100% guaranteed, no questions, then I always just look at, you know, what areas of business. It's easy for me. I just look at Wharton School of Business, the concentration areas, all of the uh, all of the Wharton undergraduate majors major in the same thing, economics, but their concentrations are different. And those are the areas that I build stories around, the concentration areas. So if I'm building around a business school, and I know that, I go to Wharton, I look at the concentrations and I ask myself, based on the students' experiences and based upon what opportunities they have ex- access to, what concentration makes the most sense. If we're not doing business clearly, then I do public economics. And public economics is probably the best way to do it because it keeps all the avenues open. In regards to like, what do you do to prep for it? There are a lot of business competitions out there. So, you know, it would make sense if you were applying clearly to a business school that you would do the Morton business competition or something like that. But in my opinion, the story to build a business story that gets you into really good business schools and arts and sciences schools is really just a public policy story with an economic undertone, right? It's like, we're going to explore a community problem that's a resource distribution problem and we're going to explore it through the lens of economics, and we're going to develop an opinion, and we're going to advocate for a perspective or a solution, and that story works really well. That's public economics. Um, if you like Googled, you know, public economics at Cornell, they don't even have that. That's a term I I thought I well, I didn't know I didn't make it up, but it was a phrase I was using, not seeing it anywhere else. People would say like, oh, I applied to college. There's no public economics, but then Harvard does have public economics. That's what they call it. So that kind of validated my term in my mind. But nonetheless, the idea, you might not see public economics a lot of different places, but I consider that to be the storyline that I would build to get into a top undergraduate business school. And that would be way more compelling than say a an investment-oriented, stock-oriented storyline, which is what a lot of the finance students are. And that's what most of the business students are. They want finance. It's like, I'm in a stock picking club and that's not an overly good story. Those are those are more way more typical. Um, I think going the public economic route is a lot more, um, it stands out a lot more. And there's also that community engagement part that a lot of other business students are missing. Yeah, for we just did, you and I just did Stern, right? And we, yep. and that was, you know, we tried to, we didn't say anything about investments and stocks. That was none of that. And he was mm-hmm. admitted to Stern because there's a community oriented feel to it. Mm-hmm. And that's what a lot of schools are looking for, too. It's, it's for their students to actually have engagements with their community, because that's what they're looking for, is students that are that go beyond just more individualistic um, goals and pursuits. To the parents out there, I always I try to explain, like, I know many of you are in positions of leadership. You hire people. Who do the colleges want? They want the same type of people you want to hire. Right? They want people who are engaged in the space, are interested in the space, and can contribute something to the space. That's what this is about. Great, thank you. Very, very good answers. You provide a lot of information. Uh, right now, it's about 10.55. We're only taking one more question um, from the, I know there's a lot of questions in the chat box. Thank you all very much, supportive um, us all the way until 11 o'clock. You guys asking great, excellent questions. A lot of them are very interesting. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people have similar questions. So we're not going to answer all of them, but we'll come to scan the barcode either have opportunity uh, to have inquiry meeting with John if you have a you know child in that space, or you scan the barcode on the right-hand side, which is you have an opportunity to answer that question in that group. Uh, we'll be able to provide some additional answer to you if your question not being answered at this moment. Let me ask in one uh, possibly, uh, I, I saw a couple of questions. Good, um, hold on. So by you sharing, I lost my chat box. Hold on one second. Okay, um, let me ask this. This is a very simple question. What is a good SAT score for applying to Ivy League plus school? 
um, <clears throat> you know, you really need to be in the middle 50 percent, middle 50th percentile of whatever school you're applying to. If you're applying ED, you might be can be a little bit below that. If you're applying RD, you should be a little bit above that. There is no magic number. I mean, the magic numbers I would say uh, on the low end would be 1500. If you're below 1500, you have a hill to, to climb. If you're over 1550, I would say that's not the reason you didn't get in then. You know, once you get 1550, whether you get 1560 or 1600 is irrelevant. So 1500 would be goal number one, 1550 would be goal number two. But the, the real statement would be you got to look at the school's middle 50 percentile and kind of be in that range depending on what you're looking at.